Hello, we're here with Grandmaster Alex Strapunski, the top player of the New Jersey Knockouts, who just played a 112-move win in Week 5 of the U.S. Chess League. This is FM Mike Klein reporting. Alex, how are you today? I'm fine. Uh, how are you, Mike? I'm doing well. Um, so, i got to be honest with you, I went to sleep thinking the game was a dead draw. Um, were you just pressing for a win because you had no losing chances, or did you think that you were winning that thing the whole time? I was not really thinking that I was winning, but uh, it was an obvious black as a match in this position because I uh, I can switch the game to opponent to win opponent game at any time thanks to uh, uh, my healthy home structure. So um, I, I practically can play for a win without uh, losing chances. It seemed like when you were trying for a win, you would try to make a pass pawn on the king side, and then at some point you just switched plans and marched your king over to the queen side. Uh, am I mistaken? Was was it always your plan to march over to the queen side, or was your original plan to make a pass pawn on the king side? Well, in this type of position, I can always speculate on queen's exchange because because all uh, opponent games have been for me. So my original plan was to create a pass pawn on the king side, but then Romanenko played h4 at this point, and it gave me opportunity to centralize my queen in order to use uh, uh, g6, h5, g4 uh, pass for my king. So I, I switched the plan at this point. After uh, I brought my king to h5 and played g5, Black got probably winning position, but then I made a mistake after h takes g. I should definitely take h takes g, and then it would be technically winning position. After my move, king takes g5, uh, he probably could hold the draw, but uh, it was not uh, easy to do, and uh, uh, he had to be very precise, so he did not find a way to do it. And after my king um, broke through, to the king side, uh, maybe it was a position. Yeah, it was very interesting. Um, I plugged it into a table base, and it said that at the end, when you played king a3, if he didn't have his c-pawn, it was actually a draw. Um, so that was very clever of you not to capture that final c-pawn. It helped block the queen's diagonal. Um, let me ask you, um, you do a lot of chess teaching. Uh, queen endgames are always so hard. Can you give any tips for lower-rated players on how to handle these types of endgames? Well, the major factor in Chris in Queen and games is how far advanced your pawns are. Uh, like in this position, um, Black had an obvious advantage on the Queen side thanks to my far advanced A pawn. And uh, um, material, if you have if you have a pass pawn, far advanced pass pawn, material is a secondary factor. So you should not be worried if you have a pawn or a couple pawns down but you have an active pawn. Something like this happened, by the way, in this game. Right, I mean, I, I guess essentially we could say that you were ahead upon most of the end game because his three on the queen side weren't any better than your two. Um, so that seems... I would say, I would say that it's like a half a pawn advantage, yes. A half a pawn, I see. Well, um, you showed great technique, and... Um, I have a feeling, I don't know for sure, that uh, you've got some Game of the Week chances. Uh, game of the Week is always kind of a subjective thing, whether technical wins should be the criteria or whether excitement. Um, I think when it comes to technical grounds, you win hands down. But uh, what do you think your chances are winning a Game of the Week prize? Um, pretty good. Well, if we gave it out for lifetime achievement, you should definitely get it because I've looked at your history and I don't think you've ever won game of the week in your seven years in the league, is that right? Uh, to be honest, I don't remember. M maybe you're right. Maybe I have never won. I, a few times I was nominated, but probably you're right. I, I have never won this prize. Well, your history with the United States Chess League goes back a long time. You actually were involved in the first ever game of the week. This was week one in the year 2005. Of course, you were on the losing end, so I think you're definitely due. And um, we wish you good luck in the voting. We shall see how it, how it works out. Um, now, now, you've played in the league seven out of eight years. That tells me you enjoy it a lot. What do you like so much about the league? Well, I like the team spirit. I like team tournaments. Uh, uh, it's actually a very pleasant feeling when uh, the every decision you make at the board should be more or less in your team interest. Like, if you take my... Uh, 
last match, uh, my opponent offered me a draw a few times, and every time I had to uh, decline because we had uh, uh, losing match most of the time. Albert Kappengut had uh, a lost position maybe from move 7, and uh, Joel did not have uh, real winning chances. At the same time, uh, our board 4 outcome was very unpredictable the whole time. So uh, basically, every every decision you make at the board in, in a team tournament should be in your team interest. You, you're not supposed to take unnecessary risk if you have a winning match. And at the same time, you, you have to push really hard if you uh, if if the team match on the line, so it's very very pleasant feeling. Well, let me ask you: um, different teams arrange their room a different way when they're playing. Are you watching your teammates' games all on your computer screen with four windows, or do they have uh, actual boards out that you're walking around to take a look at? I usually uh, watch the other games on my screen, but. Uh, this season uh, we have a fantastic place to play, it's an international chess academy and we have a big TV screen connected to internet and all four boards, uh, the spectators can see all four boards at the screen. So I can st make a step out of the room uh, and see uh, uh, the board. It sounds like a nice setup. Let me ask you a question about etiquette that you just brought up. Um, and over the board tournament, we're always sort of taught not to offer multiple draws, especially in inferior positions. Um, does that not apply in a team event because the lower three boards are constantly changing, or um, is the same rule applying? Is it uh, something we shouldn't do? Uh, I would say uh, for me it's fine even if my opponent offers me the draw like 100 times, but some other people get very annoyed. Uh, so, uh, I would say people should follow normal chess etiquette and not offer a draw, uh, like two times in a row. I see. I'm sure as a chess professional you just have to learn to, to roll with that and block it out, but it also sounds like there was no breach of etiquette in this case. Um, well, let me ask you, uh, this is your first year not playing for Manhattan. Uh, what caused the switch to the New Jersey knockouts? You know, I was a founder of Manhattan team. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I, I was living in Queens, and I founded this team. We were playing from Susan Polgar Chess Club and Forest Hills, Queens. And uh, uh, it was very emotional for me to switch the team, but I did it for one very simple reason. Right now, I live in New Jersey, and uh, it's so much more easy to commute to play inside. Uh, for example, uh, for me, it's like three minutes uh, right there. And Boris Golko, by the way, can walk to the playing site. It's like five minutes walk for him. Uh, basically, it's just a commute. I see. And is this in Fairlawn, New Jersey? Fairlawn, yes. I've been there once. It's, an, it's a nice planned community. has an interesting history. Um, now, just to clarify for the readers, the Manhattan Applesauce were once the Queen's Pioneers. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And so this is your first year not playing for that, that franchise. Um, I wasn't aware that you were the founder of the team. That's great. I can tell that you like the USCL a lot. Um, well, in looking at uh, your date of birth, it would suggest you're 41 or 42. Is that right? That's correct. And, yeah. and, I'm not 42. I see. I'm 42. <laughs> um, well, well, Douglas Adams would say that's the answer to the universe, so maybe it'll be a good year. But you're about the same age as uh, Gail Fonda and Anand, who are well, at least in the terms of Gelfand, definitely playing the best chess of their career. Um, do you believe that the best chess can still be had uh, after the age of 40? Um, I believe so. I, I, I believe so. Uh, I don't see uh, any reason why not. Uh, you know, for everyone, it's just a que question of motivation. If you find uh, time and energy to work on yourself and uh, to make a progress, then why not? Uh, some people get tired and uh, lose ambitions and uh, energy and as a result motivation and that's the main reason why a lot of people um, uh, stop playing actively after the age of 40. And I hope in, in my case 
it's uh, it will be different. Well, uh, you broke 2,700 for the first time USCF after the age of 40, and uh, you've gotten right up against 2,600 at FIDE in recent years, so would it be fair to say that you still have a lot of motivation to get better? Uh, I still have somewhat uh, uh, motivation to get better. Uh, of course, uh, at this point, I have a family, and I'm not ready to uh, sacrifice um, my family time for the sake of uh, endless travel, but at the same time I love the game very much, I, lo I love to play and uh, I hope um, I still can produce uh, pretty good games. How important is uh, physical conditioning? I'm, I'm understanding that you exercise a lot, your, your Skype picture is actually you kayaking in Lake Placid, so how often do you exercise and how important is that? It's very important, it's very important especially considering the specifics of US chess when you play multiple games a day very often, two games a day in major uh, US Opens, uh, uh, the energy level and your strength, physical strength is like I would say 70% of the success. Wow, that's quite a high figure. What else do you like to do besides kayaking? I'm running. I love to play soccer. Soccer is just the best sport ever. Um, but I'm bicycling. Um, that's basically it. Uh, uh, can you tell the listeners, are there any top players that are really good at soccer that we may not be aware of? Uh, maybe the best soccer player among chess players is uh, a Norwegian grandmaster, Simon Agdestein who played, uh, if I'm not wrong, who played a few times for his national team. Besides being a chess grandmaster, he was a fantastic uh, soccer player. Okay, very interesting. Um, let me ask you, are you right now a full-time chess coach? Is that your main job, or do you do something else? Uh, no, that's my main job. I'm coaching full-time. Um, in asking a lot of your colleagues, uh, they always regard you as one of the nicest grandmasters around. Can you play your best chess when you're so convivial, or do you have to, you know, despise your opponent a little bit while you're at the board? Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, Batvinik used to um, Batvinik uh, uh, used to make uh, notes about negative qualities of his opponents in order to get a nasty mood before the game. Um, I, I, I don't think for me it's an issue. Uh, I, I, I can play uh, normal chess regardless how I'm playing against. Uh, is a, a nice guy or not so nice? So I, I basically uh, don't care about this. Well, I've never heard that before. You know, a world champion keeping a dossier of players on their their likes and dislikes and psychology. Do you know of any other players uh, present day that do that sort of thing? Uh, I'm not sure about present day players. Uh, no, I cannot say anything about this. Well, I guess somebody can make a database of all this, but uh, I'm sure good moves are still what's going to decide most games. Uh, now, with the win this past week in Week 5, the knockouts moved to the top of the Eastern Division, at least a three-way tie. Um, how many points do you think it'll take to finish, uh, let's say, in the number one seed in the East? Uh, let's see, we have five rounds to go, right? So right, and you're sitting on three and a half out of five right now. Um, I think 7.5 would guarantee first place. 7.5, okay, so four out of the last five. That that sounds like it'll do it. Um, just want to real quick close by talking about your team a little bit. Have, have you gotten to know them a little bit? I know it's a brand new team for you. Well, I know Joel, and uh, um, I know some young players. I know, of course, Boris Gulka, and I, I was very pleased to... Uh, meet uh, Albert Kattengut, who, who was a fantastic player when he was young and who is a great uh, coach. As we all know, he is a coach of Grandmaster Gelfand and Grandmaster Smirin. Right, and for our younger listeners that don't read many chess books, his name is in parentheses in a lot of older theory books. That's how I 
I know that surname. But um, so the members of your team, since you're the uh, the leader as far as rating, and uh, you're also the eighth highest rated player in the entire league, are you able to help prepare some of your lower boards, your non-titled players for matches? Uh, I'm not doing it. Okay. Um, well, we look forward to seeing how you do the rest of the year, and uh, I think you've got good chances of Game of the Week for Week 5. That'll be announced usually Friday. Um, but we wish you well for the rest of the season, and uh, thanks very much for your time, Alex. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me. And before we close, we'd like to thank our sponsors, PokerStars, Chess.com, and the ICC. Thanks a lot, Alex. Thank you.